It's uh, wonderful to be with you tonight. Um, actually, tonight I wrote this sermon thinking that I was going to have a Sunday night crowd. Uh, not a lot of visitors, just kind of like the core group. Uh, but I'm looking around. We have a lot of visitors, a whole lot of visitors. Uh, but we're still so thankful that you're here and that you decided to worship with us tonight. Uh, you're extremely encouraging that your presence is here. The members here is obviously always encouraging. Uh, but hopefully you too will be able to take something from this sermon and apply it to your local works and the local bodies that you're a part of as well. But we thank you for being here. Uh, what I want to do is uh, finish up and read again what Rob read for us in Romans 12. If you turn there, uh, starting this off just with kind of a longer reading. If you stay engaged with me and read with me, Romans 12, starting in verse 3. Starting in verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. For we have many, I'm going to read verse 4 again, for we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. Verse 5, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So having then these gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let it use it to our ministering, he who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, and honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuation steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. And looking at Romans 12, and we read this often, but he paints the perfect picture of what God and Jesus expect out of their body, which is the church. This is what they expect. They expect us to be kind to one another, to have this brotherly love with one another. They expect us to understand that even though we are very and many, we are numerous, yet we are all still in the same body. And by being in the same body, we did have different functions, but all of our functions, whatever they may, go to the benefit of the body as a whole. And we are supposed to function in this way, and we're supposed to act this way, and we're supposed to live this way, that even though we are many, we are one body, that body being the body of Christ. So he goes on at the end of starting verse 7, he explains, look, if you're able to do this thing, we'll go out and go do that thing. If you're able to exhort, then go out and exhort. Do that before, for the body that you're a part of. And then he goes into, I think, 9 through 16 is a little bit kind of more random in thought. Uh, but I like the idea that he's saying, look, don't be lagging in diligence, verse 11, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. That when you realize that there's something that you can do for the body, you, you don't diddly-dally about it. Uh, you don't, you know, just kind of shrug off and, and just kind of maybe I'll get to that one day. No, you diligently do the things that you can do for the body. And this is what I want to talk about tonight. And this is why I said, I, I was thinking, you know, this is going to be a Sunday night sermon because I want to talk to this group about something that we can do better about. We can do better about as a local church, which is we can be using our talents more effectively and more efficiently than we are now. Some of us grew up in smaller congregations. Uh, when maybe it was only 30 or 20 or 40, something of that number. And usually I think the smaller congregations are usually a little bit better at this. And what it is, is, is they're very aware of who each other are. They're very aware of what each other do. They're very involved with each other's lives. Simply just because there's not as many to learn. There's not as many people to know. Not as many people talents to be experienced with. But when we have a group 
a local body that is of this size here at Gardendale, it is something we constantly have to be on our toes about. It is something that we have to constantly remind ourselves and sometimes constantly rebuke ourselves saying, look, this is something that we need to be doing better than we are doing now. We need to make sure that we're connected. We're making sure that we understand that we're all using our functions and that no one is getting hid behind the shadows, behind the curtains. And we don't know who those people are. And eventually they kind of fall and fall and fall further, further away from us because they're not connected. And when these people fall and they leave and they're not connected anymore, it's sad because a lot of us don't even realize that they were part of our group in the first place. And it becomes a huge problem that I think that we need to talk about and we need to discuss. And let me say, at the end of this sermon, the solution is not to hold hands and sing kubaya. That that is not where I'm going with this. When we talk about unity, it's a serious problem. The solution is not just to hold hands in a circle, even though I think that would help to a degree. The solution is to be active. To be engaged. And that responsibility to be engaged is not the elder's responsibility. It's not the preacher's responsibility. It's not your parents' responsibility. It's not the people sitting on your pew's responsibility. It's your responsibility to be engaged. And God, here in Romans 12 and in other passages, has commanded you to be engaged. And to be diligent to use the abilities that you have for this local body, and for the church as a universal as a whole. And we'll be looking at that. What I did is, I had spring break this week, so I had a little bit of extra time to make a sermon. So what I did is, is I want to show you that the first century church practiced what they preached. And where we get that we learn that even though these people are many, they're still the same body, that they used the gifts that they were given. We see in verse 6, he says, Paul, having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. And I want to show you throughout the New Testament where people use the gifts that they had. And I found all of these in the greetings. At the very last chapter of all these epistles that Paul gives out these greetings and these shout outs to different people. And we learn a lot about people using their gifts. So if you look at the end of this book of Romans, 16, 1 through 2, and I have several of these. But we first, in this greeting, in the first epistle that we have in the New Testament, we see that there was a woman named Phoebe, and Phoebe was a helper. First two verses here of chapter 16, I commend you to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant in the church of Centuria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many, and of my, myself also. This woman, Phoebe, she's coming to Rome. You get connected with her. You assist her because this woman is a helper. She's helped myself. She's helped others. This is something this she can do, and Phoebe is recognized because of the way she used her gift. She helped. She is a helper. And I think if we think about helpers... I think of a lot of the ladies that get here and they work on these classrooms. Those are helpers. I think about a lot of the people that came to the work day to get the Bible classroom set up. Those are helpers. And there's a lot of times we're helping each other that I don't know about. That is not publicly done, but there are helpers here. And if you're a helper, this is a gift that you can use. I'm going to go through this a little bit more quicker now. Aquila and Priscilla, they were protectors. They were also fellow workers In the faith. Next two verses, verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. That Aquila and Priscilla, all the Gentiles respected them because they were fellow workers with Paul, but they were willing to risk their necks for Paul's life. Aquila and Priscilla were protectors. Do you have people in this congregation that if you were in mortal danger, those would be the people you would run to for protection? If you were in spiritual danger, do you have people here that you would run to for spiritual protection? People that would risk their necks for your sake. I'm not going to read this verse, but we see in verse 6 and verse 12, Mary, Tryphena. We're getting to the point where I'm going to start saying these Greek names really fast with confidence. And I'm going to pretend like I'm pronouncing them correctly. Tryphosa, Persis, they were all laborers in the Lord. These people were workers of the Lord. 
Now, it doesn't specify of what they were working, what they were laboring in, but they were recognized as, hey, these people, these people work. These people labor. They work hard in the Lord. Verse 13, we learn about Rufus's mother. Rufus's mother in verse 13 of chapter 16 says, Great Rufus chosen in the Lord and his mother in mine. And I think the ESV says, Who is also as a mother to me. And I think we don't usually take this that this was actually Paul's mother here. But Paul recognized a woman who was like a mother to him in the Lord. And it also so happened to be actually Rufus's mother. So greet this woman because she's like a mother to me. Even the great apostle Paul found the need for having a woman in the Lord that would serve like a mother figure to him. Someone that could guide him in that way. Someone he could seek comfort to in that way. A, actually a mother in the Lord. We could probably take this all back to the cross when Jesus told John, Behold your mother, and told John, Behold your son. And I think that's where that mother in the Lord relationship, that's when it started. That John would now see Mary as a mother, and Mary would see John as a son in the Lord. Continuing on, we learn in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and 16, 12 of who Apollos was. Even though we could go to Acts and talk about how Aquila and Priscilla had to teach Apollos more correctly and that he was eloquent. But in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about him as being someone who's an aider and a waterer. That this is someone that Paul realized that Apollos came in and watered this congregation that he had planted the seed for. And that even at the end of the book in chapter 16, he says, I really want Apollos to come to you because I know he can help. He can aid, but he says he's going to come to you in a more convenient time. And I think I hint a little bit of frustration in Paul's voice when he says that. That he wants Apollos to come to them to work with the Corinthians, but he just can't come right now. And what it was is I believe that Paul knew how effective Apollos could be as an aider and a waterer. And he just simply could not make it. And that was frustrating. Like, come on, Apollos, I need you. This is somewhere you could help. And Apollos just couldn't come. It just didn't work out. But as people say this about you, Apollos, that guy, he can water. That person can aid. There's someone I need that knows spiritual help. I can send that person to this person, Apollos, because he can get them spiritually connected back to the Lord. He's a waterer. First Corinthians 16 as well, Stephanus, Fortunus, and Acacius were suppliers. 16, 17. Let's read that one. First Corinthians 16, 17. I am glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunus, and Acacius. For what they were lacking on your part, they supplied. For they refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge such men. So Corinthians, the things that you were supposed to take care of, you didn't do it. So these guys, they supplied what you lacked. They supplied your needs, Paul's needs. Do here, are you a supplier? Are you someone that sees, okay, something's lacking? I can supply that. Maybe that could be financial assistance. I can supply that. Maybe that's you need someone to cut the grass at the building. Hey, I can supply that. Are you a supplier? Epaphroditus, probably one of the more famous ones, Philippians 4. Philippians 4.18, if you want to turn there. I try to at least kind of go chronologically in the book so you didn't have to flip too much. But at the end, I'm, I'm going to mess that all up and I'm going to go all over the place. But until then, I'm trying to at least stay at least close in proximity to where you just were. Philippians 4.18, it says, Indeed, I have all and abound. This is Paul speaking. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. We learn that in another chapter that Epaphroditus was sick, he was close to death, but he accomplished the mission that the church at Philippi wanted him to do, which is to bring assistance, what would have been financial assistance, to the Apostle Paul. And Epaphroditus carried that assistance to Paul. And of course, Paul's extremely appreciative of it, and he's saying, look, this is a sweet-smelling aroma. This is an acceptable sacrifice. This is something that God was happy about, that Epaphroditus worked in this way. Some of us, maybe we think that the only thing we could possibly do is carry something. Maybe I can't produce the assistance. Maybe I can't uh, receive the assistance. I don't need to receive the assistance. But you know what? Maybe what I can do is I can carry the assistance. 
And no matter if I get really badly sick, no matter if all these different things come up, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make sure I accomplish what, I was, what I'm going to do, which is I am going to carry something. Tychicus, Colossians 4, 7, if you want to turn there. This was a situation when Paul wanted to send help to a congregation. He couldn't go himself, so he sent someone instead. Colossians 4, verse 7. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. So because Tychicus was going to be able to go to the church at Colossae, he was going to be able to learn about their circumstances. And as he learned about their circumstances, he could find the ways to comfort them. And I just feel like this would be a great thing. Like, you know you would feel good about yourself, or at least know you're accomplishing something, if the Apostle Paul sends you a congregation because he knows that you can comfort this congregation. You know what, Tychicus? You know how to evaluate people's circumstances. You know how to comfort people with the word. Tychicus, I'm going to send you because you're going to be able to help this situation. Tychicus was able to understand people's circumstances and find ways to comfort them. Epaphras, Colossians 4.12, just a couple of verses down. Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, and you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Uh, Just look at other versions. The ESV says, always struggling on the behalf of his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. And the NIV changes that word struggling, and it uses the word wrestling. So that this is someone that would struggle, wrestle, labor in prayer for the church at Colossae. This is what he would do. He would wrestle in prayer. For the church as a whole. If all of these things, you thought I couldn't do any of these things, this is one that we can all do. We can wrestle, labor, struggle in prayer for this congregation. I did not think of this. i got to give credit to where credit's due. Nathan Jones, I was telling him about this when we went camping this weekend, and I brought up Epaphras. Because I had never really thought about Epaphras. This is someone that labored in prayer that the congregation would stand fast. And what he brought up, and I want to share this with you, is do you remember another person that wrestled, that labored, that struggled with God? Jacob wrestled with God in Genesis chapter 32 at the very end. And what he did is is he wrestled with this angel because he demanded a blessing. And finally, you know, the angel, he's had enough. The angel touches his hip, and Jacob's going to walk with a limp for the rest of his life because of this. But the angel almost in a way... Uh, appreciates Jacob's persistence and says, you know what, I am going to bless you. And God ends up blessing Jacob right there in Genesis 32, changing his name. But he received that blessing because he was willing to struggle, to wrestle, to the point where he would receive what he asked for. And we could go to Jesus as well, doing the parable of the unrighteous judge and how the woman is so persistent with the unrighteous judge that he, she eventually gets justice. How much more so the righteous judge, the Father, will give you something, a blessing, because of your persistence, because of your labor, because of your wrestling. We need more people at Gardendale wrestling in prayer for this congregation. Because what I want, and I know I think what you want as well, is God to receive so many prayers, heartfelt prayers, wrestling in prayers for this congregation that he's just going to hey, you know what, they're persistent. They're persistent. I'm going to get involved even more so than I already am. And, of course, I'm going to let God make the decisions of the way that he wants to take care of us. I'm going to leave that part up to him, but I know that we can be persistent about it. We need more Epaphrases, and I think every congregation needs several, several Epaphrases, as many as they can get. 2 Timothy 1. I'm not just going to paraphrase this one. He brings up Onesphorus, that he was a refresher. I almost really butchered that word. When you say Onesphorus was a refresher, it just it runs together. Onesphorus was a refresher. What it is, is, is when Paul goes to Rome, Onesphorus finds him and makes sure that he has everything he needs. 
So he was obviously evidently in Rome. He finds out Paul's been brought to Rome in chains. I'm going to take care of Paul because I know this is a way that I can use the grace that's been given unto me. So Onesphorus refreshed Paul in 2 Timothy 1. To show us maybe some of the more famous ones that we know about. We learn about Philemon. In Philemon 2, verse 2, was a beloved friend and a fellow laborer, and he provided assistance to Paul, giving him a place to stay when he was there in Colossae. We learn about Onesimus was a minister to Paul, uh, and that was in a physical way that he ministered by taking care of Paul. But evidently you could use it as well as uh, being a minister in spiritual things to Paul. Barnabas, obviously, Barnabas was an encourager. We learn about him in Acts 4.36. He was the son of encouragement. And when no one else would take Paul in Galatians, Barnabas did. He took Paul and he made sure Paul had the things that he needed as he got his journey started with Jesus Christ. Paul, we learn from Peter's account, 2 Peter 3.16, that Paul had the wisdom of God and Paul was willing to share the wisdom of God. And Peter endorses all of Paul's letters there. And as well, Luke. Luke was loyal. Luke was loyal. 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul explains all the people that have left him in his terrible state. When things are getting really bad for Paul there near the end. But of all the people that left, including Titus that forsook Paul, Luke was with him. Luke stayed with him. And that just shows extremely, extremely the amount of this man's character. As well, if you look at the end of Acts, when Paul's going through the shipwreck and the third missionary journey and all the bad things that happened to Paul in the third missionary journey, there's a very important pronoun in that part of Acts. And that pronoun is we. We. Meaning that of all the bad things that Paul went through being shipwrecked, being living on that island trying to get rescued, all those terrible things... Luke was with them. Luke was with them. Luke was loyal. And I would have loved to have a Luke for the rest of my life. This person is going to stick with you. This person is going to make sure you have what you need. And he's just going to be with you and support you no matter what. No matter what situation you are in. Of the body, of the many of us, who by far is the most important worker of the Lord's church? Well, it's the Lord himself. He is the most important fellow worker, and we could add anything to this. Jesus was and is. He is a savior. He is the propitiator of our sin. He is the reconciler of us to God. He is the head of the church of the body. He is the head of the body. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Anything you want to put in there that attributes himself to him, Jesus was all these things in the New Testament church, and he still is those things Today, he is an important, the most important member of this local body as our head, as our leader, and as the one who makes all of our decisions as we find them in his word. To go from another perspective and kind of focus on Paul for just a second. Paul did these things and encouraged others. It wasn't just that Paul was constantly receiving these things from these lists that we just gave. Paul did give back just as the grace he received. Who are the two people that we see Paul receive a lot from in the New Testament? That would be Timothy and that would be Titus. We actually have books written to them explaining about how much Paul was trying to encourage these guys to keep on doing. And Paul giving basically his heart and everything to these men so that they can continue in their work. There's another one that I put up here, but Archippus in Colossians, and he's mentioned again in Philemon. This is, would have been another young man that Paul would have endorsed, taken care of, encouraged, and helped him in any way. And even though Paul found that he could give to these men to take care of these men, these men would help Paul in return. So it wasn't just a one-way street of encouragement. Timothy and Titus found ways to give back to Paul. To give an example, Timothy would have checked on the Thessalonians for Paul to strengthen and encourage, establish their faith when Paul couldn't go to the Thessalonians. Timothy helped Paul in that way. Titus. Titus aided Paul in getting Paul back connected to the Corinthians. So when the Corinthians start to slander Paul and try to kick Paul out, we learn in 2 Corinthians 7 that Titus is sent because the Corinthians are going to love Titus. And for some reason, the Corinthians end up loving Titus. They love him to death. They love this guy. And Paul reminds them of St. Corinthians, by the way, that guy that you love so much, Titus, yeah, I sent him to you. 
yeah, that was me. So y'all need to be sure that y'all are loving me just as much as you're loving him and give Paul a chance to get reconnected with the Corinthians. So Titus helped Paul in that way, even though Paul would give to them as well. I don't have anything for Archippus because the Bible doesn't have anything about Archippus, but I'm sure he did something for Paul. I'm sure he was encouraging as well. The problem with this is, as you can see, all these people that we've talked about in the New Testament are remembered by what they were. This person was an encourager. This person was a helper. This person was a comforter. There are also Christians in the New Testament that are remembered for the bad things that they did. And they're remembered for the ways that they labored and worked in evil things. We remember Hymenaeus and Alexander, who Paul actually says that he had to withdraw himself from to deliver them up to Satan because they were blasphemers. They were blasphemers. Demas, saying to Timothy 4.10, he was a lover of this present world and he forsook Paul because he cared so much more about the things going on in the world and his position in the world and his popularity in the world, whatever it was that it led him back to the world, then he cared about Paul. Then he cared about Jesus Christ. This is what Demas was remembered as a lover of this present world. And of course, Diotrephes. Diotrephes loved preeminence in this world. And when John tried to go to him, apparently Diotrephes refused him. So refused to take John and his party in 3 John 9. These people were remembered for the bad things they did. So let me say this to you. If you're a member here at Gardendale, I don't think that there is no way that you are a worker. I think you're going to be a worker regardless. I think what matters and what it depends on is who you're working for. You're going to either work as a good example or you are going to work as a bad example. I don't really think there's an in-between. And if you want to try to argue that being lazy and not doing anything is a worker of nothing, I would try to suggest to you that the worker who is lazy is the worker that's actually working for the bad example. Well, look at Andrew. He doesn't do anything. Andrew, I never hear of him doing anything. I've tried to ask Andrew for help, and he refused me several times. You know what? I want to, maybe I should just be like Andrew since he doesn't do anything. I, maybe I might as well not do anything either. That would be someone that would be a bad example for the local work and could harm the local work in many ways. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, but these people are the people that we do not want to be. To try to wrap things up, and I know we flipped a lot, and we went to a lot of different greetings and all that. But thinking of Romans 12 and what we've all talked about, I just want you to review in your mind uh, some things to think about. And I'm trying to maybe steal a little bit from Logan Gandy from that exhortation he gave a couple weeks ago, and he asked you to think about these things. Are you this person? This is what I want to do here a little bit. Are you, whoever you are, are you a helper? Is that you? Would your friends, would the people sitting on the pew with you, would they consider you to be a helper? Most importantly, would God consider you to be a helper? Are you a protector, like Priscilla and Aquila? Are you a laborer? Are you someone that just wants to be a worker for the Lord? Are you a mother in the Lord? Are there young men and young women that you encourage by being a mother in a Lord? Are you an aider or a waterer, like Apollos? Are you a supplier? Do you find the things that are lacking and realize, hey, I can supply those things? Are you a comforter? Can you realize people's circumstances and find ways to comfort them? Are you in a laborer in prayer, like Epaphras is, specifically for this congregation? Are you a refresher? One thing I was thinking about, the refreshers. I think one of the most refreshing things that we do is those exhortations that we have on Wednesday night. You've been at work all week. Uh, You've been away from spiritual things. And to come back to have a Bible class and someone that can get up here and give a solid five minute, five minute, to give a solid five minute point that's efficient and effective. Some one point that we can all go home and think about. That is a refreshment. That person that can get up here and give a solid point for us to think about efficiently and effectively, that is refreshing.
That is spiritually refreshing, and I think that's a spiritual gift of someone that can do that. Are you a friend like Philemon? Are you a minister, whether that be a phys- physical minister or a spiritual minister like Onesimus? Are you an encourager like Barnabas? Are you a sharer of wisdom like Paul? Are you loyal like Luke? Can you fit any of these things? If you don't think you can, you have a problem. And what I would say is, is that you have a sin problem. And I'm going to save that and talk a little bit more about that closer to the end of this. I'm not going to try to go through here and tell y'all which ones y'all belong to. I, I can't. I don't have time for that. And, of course, God would be the only person that could really officially stamp you with these different things that you could be doing or that you are doing. Uh, but I will say this. I promise I was never going to cry in front of y'all. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Anita Benton, she is my mother in the Lord. And it hurts how bad she's been sick, and she can't be here. And she's trying. I know she is. I'm trying to call her and talk to her and stuff like that. But it's, it's difficult. It's difficult when she's not here. And I realize that, that of the weeks that have gone by that she couldn't be here, it was affecting me. And it's like this little hole's right there, right where she sits. And I, I imagine that maybe Paul, when he was preaching, that, uh, that Rufus' his mother would listen. And Anita looks at me and she's, as I preach, and then sometimes she's doing this when something bad, you know? I don't know. <clears throat> and then she'll come to me and she'll, she'll be sarcastic and so sassy how she is. But she'll remember points and she'll be like, hey, that point, that point you said there, that third slide, that was good. That fourth point, I didn't like that one as much. And, but she has been so encouraging since the first day I walked in here. And I hope she gets better. And I hope she gets better soon. I ask you to pray for her. I've been praying for her, but I miss her. And you see how effective these people are here. How effective Ruthless mothers could have been. How effective Paulus could have been. How effective Archibus could have been. Because they were workers. Because they were like, hey, I can do something. I can get involved. I can get engaged. And I want us to all be that. And the thing is, this isn't going to happen overnight. But it's something we're going to have to constantly, constantly work on. So that we can be these things. Just so it said, I have never cried in front of y'all in front of the pulpit. I held it together. I held it together, and I'm going to move. I'm going to move on. I want to ask you these two questions. It's two questions for yourself. Who here is your Barnabas? And the second question I want to ask you is who is your Timothy? Who is your Timothy? Now, the reason why I phrased the first question the way I did, who here is your Barnabas? Who here is your Barnabas? Because I'm afraid sometimes if I say, ask the question to y'all, who is your Barnabas, just who is your Barnabas, many of you, knowing you, would answer two names, Jeff May or David Hartzell. I think the world of both those men. David Harsel, I give him credit for getting me to start preaching. I was with him at Northwood, loved him to death. Past couple of years at camp that some of us are part of, FC camp, Jeff May is always the counselor with me. We have the 11th grade boys. Love him to death. Great guy. And if I have problems and I had to go to those men, I would. The thing is, though, is that Jeff May, David Hartzell, some of those other men that have had very powerful, good effects on this congregation, they're not here. They're not here anymore. And to give you an example, I feel like I'm very close to David Maxson. I was there with him at Northwood. And especially when I was first here, I would call David a lot and I would talk to David about what was going on here. Ask for his advice. Ask for his help. What I've noticed is the past couple of years being here, I don't call David as much as I used to. And what it is is, is I've found other Barnabases here. People that actually are involved in my life know about my life. Because when I decide to call David Maxson, even though he's so helpful and so wise and so helpful to me, it still takes me 30 minutes to describe the situation that I'm thinking about. But if I go to Mr. Rusty, 
But I go to Mr. Michael, I go to Mr. Mr. Andy, Mr. Clayton, uh, Mr. Chuck, I have Mr. Kim, all, all of you. When I go to y'all, I don't have to give you a 30-minute conversation about what's going on. Usually you already know because you live with me. You're part of my local family. So what I want to ask you here is, who is your Barnabas here? Who is your Barnabas here? As well, who is your Timothy here? Who is the young person that you're encouraging, you're reaching out to? And again, to go with this, don't say somebody that you know from FC camp or rustic youth camp or leadership camp or whatever. It's great to have those people that you encourage, but who is your encur- who's the one you encourage here? The person that you live with, that you're effective with, you see every Lord's Day, every Wednesday night. Make sure you have someone here. If you did not know any of the answers to those two questions, you couldn't think of anyone here. Let me rebuke you. You're doing it wrong. You are an effective person. You can be efficient. You can be a worker here at Gardendale. You are doing something wrong. You can be helpful, but you're not being helpful. Don't be a bad example. So what you do is, if that is you, take that rebuke, but be efficient with it. Be effective with it. Say, okay, you know what? I've recognized something. I'm going to be honest with myself. I'm going to get busy. I'm going to make sure that in the next couple days that I do have a Barnabas here, that I do have a Timothy here. I'm going to find one of the things, and I'm going to get busy because I want to be a worker for the Lord. And I want to help this congregation in any way I can. Thank you so much for your attention tonight. Of course, I appreciate you, and I want us to work together uh, to be better about this every day. Because I even know there's some things that I need to be better about, I need to grow. And there's some of these things that I feel like I'm not doing as well as I need to, but I'm going to make changes. And I'm going to do the best that I can. There's many of us here, or some of us here, I don't know. I know the Lord knows the number uh, that are here They're always here. They could be a great work for this work here. They could do a lot of things good for the Lord. But they have yet to be reconciled with God. They can't fit that position yet. Because they have yet to do the most important thing, which is get right with Jesus. You get right with the Lord through Jesus Christ, then... You can become a working part of this congregation. Then you can become a working part of the universal body. Then you can become a working part of whatever congregation you're going to place membership with. But what's the first most importance is that you get right with Jesus. Get right with God first. And that's going to be through repentance and baptism. If anyone likes to do that tonight, to be a part of the universal body as Jesus would add you to the church as we read about in Acts chapter 2. We want to help you with that tonight. If there's any other spiritual thing that we can take care of as a church family, as a whole, then please come forward as we stand and as we sing.